Good morning. Everybody doing okay? Still awake? Warmed up? We got a good 35, 40 minutes left. <clears throat> amen. There it's first amen. Goes to Tara Musselman. Let it be known. 21 days of prayer, second week, eighth day. We are continuing our emphasis on prayer as we start this new year. Uh, last week, I, pray, I, I told you about uh, bracelets that I ordered that say pray first. They told me, I got an email on Monday morning and it said the bracelets would not be here until January 16th. And I thought, oh no. So you know what I did? <laughs> I prayed first. Guess what came Monday night? It was Monday night, right? I came, I came home from basketball. The bracelets. They were on my kitchen counter, and I just said, but God. <laughs> I almost cried a little bit. It was just a stupid DHL bag, and they're just plastic bracelets. But when God answers prayer, I don't know about you, but it touches my heart. It's a small prayer. We could have, doesn't, anyway. Another small prayer. Kroger has mysteriously lost all their cards. And I posted it on Facebook. And Pastor Gary called me out. And he said, you should pray first. Well, I went in there the next time, and guess what? There were carts in there. I don't know what's going on. It's okay. What spaces this week have you carved out to pray? What times have you taken to pray first? If you don't have a bracelet yet, they're on the back out there. Please take one. I would love for you to take one. You can't wear it. That's okay. Mine, I had to pre-stretch because if I get going and I put too many of these things on here, my arm starts looking like a beef wellington. It's not a good thing. And so, huh? Manly straight. I just let them sit there overnight. And so, but they're out there. They're great. Also, just so you know, <clears throat> have prayer bracelets out there. Pray first, not prayer, scripture bracelets. They have all sorts of scriptures on them. You have to check it before you go. So if you like one, this is Philippians 4, 6. It says, do not be anxious about anything unless it's really big and you should be worrying about it. <laughs> do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. It's a simple reminder that as I've gone through this week, I, I've learned that I need more simple reminders, small things, small times to, to say, okay, stop and pray, stop and pray. You know what I did this morning when, when the audio wouldn't work? I prayed. In the past, I would have been like, oh my goodness. And John's back there like, I prayed too, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so they're out there, so you'll know. Um, the, the pray first bracelets are out there as well, continuing to find that space uh, to pray. We're, we're, we're continuing each night at 8.30. So if you want to join us online, that's great. Uh, it's been a few years ago, but uh, missions trip, or the youth group took a missions trip to Philly. And um, we had one, one night, we decided to go uh, to the Rocky Steps. Because I love, I love Rocky. Anybody else love the movies Rocky? No? Loved it. I like the one where, where he fights, um, oh, Drago. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge mismatch. Well, there, when we were on the missions trip, there was a, there was a mismatch as well. And um, Henley Drew was with us. And I said, Henley, Henley, Henley's tall, skinny. She can run faster than me. I said, let's race up the Rocky steps. Let's do a Rocky and I'm a little competitive, and so we raced. I won't tell you who won, but there were excuses made. <laughs> to this day, excuses made. But there was a mismatch in, in that movie and in the running because it, it wasn't close. I looked down, and she was still... I'm, <laughs> 
So he's standing there. I don't know if you remember the, the beginning of that movie. They're getting ready to go, and you know all the stuff that happens with Apollo, and he gets there, and he's fighting after he's gone to Russia and trained with crazy snow, and here we are with no snow and beef. Anyway. So he gets up there, and he goes to, like, hit gloves, and, and Drago's gloves are just right there, and they don't move. And it's like, oh, this is a mismatch. We find a mismatch. We, we have things that, that we come up against in our lives, and we're overmatched. We find a giant in the Bible, in the story we've heard many times, standing well over nine foot tall with armor that weighed 125 pounds. This giant was skilled in battle and surely had, had killed many men. Then we see a king cowering behind his army as he had cowered in the baggage before he was made king. You know, it, it, the, the Bible tells us that, that he was, the king stood over six foot tall. He was tall. He was a tall for, for that time. That king had extensive battle experience, and he had the quality of all of Israel to match the armor that Goliath would have had. But he wasn't out there fighting. Instead, we see a five foot something, sheep herder, not a soldier. He was just an ancient Grubhub delivery guy bringing food to his brothers. That's all, he was, he was, that's all he was doing that day. They didn't tip him either. That is the background of this story. And I wonder that today, where in your life do you feel overmatched? Where are you feeling overwhelmed? Where do you feel that there's just no hope? There's no, there's no possibility for this thing to go right. There's just no path forward for me. I don't know which way to go. Do you feel overmatched this morning? Are you struggling with things you just can't seem to get around or to get over or to get through? King Saul and his army are described as they were described as terrified and deeply shaking. I wonder this morning, do you find yourself this, in front of whatever you're facing as terrified and deeply shaken? Goliath and the Philistine army, they were described as loud and brash, and they were just cocky. And they, they, these other guys, they, just had, they had to be annoying. The ones that were behind Goliath, you know those guys? And Goliath's up there doing his thing, and they got the guys that are a little pipsqueaks back behind. He's like, yeah, why are you going to mess with them? Go ahead. It's the guy standing behind the guy who isn't as confident when the big guy isn't standing there. David rolls up, passing out the food, and he hears this, this trash talking coming from the Israelite army, and, he, and, and he's ready for a fight. That is where we catch the story in 1 Samuel 17. You've heard this story, but let's read it again. Said this, starting in verse 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Verse 33, it says this. Don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Coming from the man who should have been out there. Oof. But David persisted, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. He's had experience. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it again. I'll, I'll do it, I will do it to this Philistine too. For he, had, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. All right, go ahead, he said. And may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armory, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped it, the, the sword over it and took, one, uh, took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. I can't go in, in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. David was overmatched physically, obviously. No one was, was planning for David to win that day. Except for David. 
He was overmatched with battle experience. He had fought animals, but Goliath surely had more experience. He was overmatched with victories and skill. But David remembered that God had been there. He remembered that it was God who rescued him against lions and bears. He remembered that it was God who was with him. He remembered that it was God who gave him strength. He remembered that it was God who prepared him and armed him and protected him. Not armor, not skill, not experience, not physical stature or strength. And I wonder this morning, are we remembering how our battles have been won? It's God. God helping us. So then we go on in verse 41. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him. Sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy, am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at, we, come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. Who will conquer him? The Lord. Lord. Who will conquer him? The Lord. And I will kill you and cut off your head. This is a crazy message to be doing on Family Sunday. (laughs) And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know This, I love this verse, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with the sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. And so as Goliath moved closer, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag. We know this story. We've seen it. Taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Now this morning, as I was reading that, I don't know what stands out to you, but I had a crazy thought. The scripture doesn't tell us what happened to to Goliath's armor bearer. Where did he go? He said he was out there with Goliath, that he was in front of him, and David starts, so it starts running towards him, and it doesn't say where it is. So let's just make some assumptions this morning. Goliath's armor bearer wasn't tall enough to protect Goliath, obviously, because he threw the stone, and it went over him and hit Goliath. He wasn't tall enough. He was not agile enough to protect him either and didn't meet Goliath's need of being that first line of defense. And then David walks into this battle with prayer and runs out to meet Goliath, loaded with having prayed already and with God as his armor bearer. And I'm telling you, if we're going into our battles, no matter what area of our life it is, without God going before us and us praying first, this isn't just a cute little little, uh, phrase that we want to say. It is a practical phrase because church, if we try to go into our battles that really aren't ours, we'll get to that in a minute. If we try to go into these battles that we're facing without praying, we're going out, we're going in there without protection. We don't have God before us. His armor bearer is not going out before us. We have an armor bearer that's in front of us that that we think, oh, I've got experience in this. I don't really need to ask God to help me. I've been through this before. I know. I'll handle it. It'll be fine. Be okay. Okay. I don't need God's guidance in my finances. I don't need God's, fi- we already went through last week all the areas that God's supposed to be in. But if we don't go into our battles by praying first and having God as our first line of defense with prayer, we're, we're, we're in trouble. We have to pray first. We have to be a church that prays first. When we pray, we go into uh, our lives with the power of God covering every area. With the power of God covering every area that we bring him into. What areas of your life, what battles are you facing that have you not brought God into yet? What struggles are you facing that that you've just been fighting on your own and you're just kind of spinning your wheels? Because you haven't stopped and taken the time to go before the Lord and, and said, God, here I am and here is this. 
What if I go to him and he doesn't give me the answer I want? What if I go to him and, and he tells me to do the opposite of what I really want to do? God's ways are not our ways. They're higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We'll get to that next week. But if we become so prideful, thinking that we know best, we know where pride's going to lead us. We're going to fall. When we pray, we aren't retreating like Saul, hiding away, wringing our hands together, worrying about all that we're facing. They sat there for days, terrified. He comes out and he's, he just, oh, you guys are weak. You can't do all these things. And he's sitting there, retreated, frightened. That is not the church. That is not the church. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if we are sitting around frightened and worried and scared, that's not what God wants for us. I know, there aren't too many amens on that one. You're like, Pastor Andy, I, I just like to worry. It's so easy. You don't even know. I worry before I worry. Then I worry about my worrying about my worry. And then I worry about, you get it. But why aren't we bringing God into every area? You know, the easiest person to lie to is yourself. And only you can answer that question. If you have areas where you're struggling and you really haven't prayed and gone to God, maybe you should start asking the question of, of your heart, of stopping and saying, why haven't I prayed about this yet? What is it that I think that I can do better than God? We can't be sitting around, scared of the outcomes, terrified of all of the what ifs. No, when we pray, we must understand that pray, prayer is reloading, not retreating. Prayer is reloading, not retreating. Prayer is preparing for our battles, but not passively sitting and waiting for something to go wrong or the next thing to go wrong or watching the news and waiting for the next bad thing or listening to the scanner like my dad and grandpa used to do. Waiting to hear all the crazy things that happen in our world. Oh, can you believe? Yeah. Prayer is preparing, is, is praying for those things. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, it says this. A final word, be strong in the Lord. We should be, prepare, be preparing our hearts in this way. And in, his, and in his mighty power, put on all the armor all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Have you done that? Verse 12, and this is a great reminder for us this morning. Prayer is reloading, not retreating. And we need to remember as we're reloading and God is filling us up. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will, be able, you will still be standing firm. Verse 14, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Just means that we are honest and, and we have integrity. We're people of integrity. And sometimes, like I just talked about, we need to be more honest with ourselves. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Are you being honest with those around you and with yourself? Are you being honest in your prayer life? Are you being honest when you come before the Lord? Are you becoming a little prepared and having you know, a certain prayer? Is that how you're doing it? Be honest, the belt of truth. And the body armor of God's righteousness. We must be guarding our hearts from words or addictions or struggles that come between us and God. We must just not guard our hearts from sin. I had this thought as I, my, my sermon was finished for the week and, and I just, and in one of my prayer times, I, I, I felt like I needed to share this with you this morning. We must not just guard our hearts from sin. We must guard our hearts from believing the lies and tricks of the enemy. He doesn't always try to destroy us with outright blatant sin. He also works in deeply deceitful ways by using our words or actions of others to plant seeds of doubt and discouragement and despair and defeat. 
That if we let all of those things going on, all the noise around us, if we leave it to grow it's go- in our hearts, it's going to start spreading. Then we start believing those lies. We become different people. When we start believing the lies and the tricks of the enemy, we, we start to become different people on different paths with different motivations and without sinning necessarily, we find ourselves moving far from the heart of God with our thinking, with our emotions, and then eventually spiritually. So church, I'm going to tell you, we need to guard our hearts this morning. Verse 15, for shoes, put on uh, the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Meaning like cleats, we need good, fo- good footing that comes from keeping our minds uh, full of God through prayer and his word. Um, each summer, our, our um, softball team plays out at Krieger, and there's this one diamond. Well, not, it doesn't matter. Some diamonds are, are messed up. Um, but we get to this one batter's box, and it is, it is like, it is so soft. And I get in there, and, and, I'm, and I, I, there's this ref. I won't say it wasn't Mike. Okay? Let's start with there. But I get in there. I want you to be able to see this. Hold on a second. I get into the batter's box, and I'm telling the ref, I say, I'm like, I need time. Because here I am. I needed a shovel, but I only had my cleats. I'm like, whew, I'm getting this dirt out of here because it is just pillowy soft. And I'm a big guy, and if I stand on a pillow, whew, I go in, and I'm trying to hit the ball and run, right? So you don't want to have, like, to jump off of a pillow. Just not a good idea. So here I am. I'm like, this guy, he goes, no, you can't have time getting the batter's box. Uh, what? I was like, I'm trying to get. The... So anyway, he said, no, go ahead and pitch it. So you know what I did? You, get, you, get, you start with one strike, you get two more. I said, go ahead and pitch it. I let him pitch the ball, and I continued to dig out. <laughs> The batter's box. And it was a strike. It's like, oh boy, okay. So finally I get in there. I look back at the umpire. I give him a look. I, won't, I, I didn't say anything. I get in there and they throw the pitch and I hit it. And then I can take off running. There are so many times I think we get in a situation where someone tells us something and we go, oh no, oh no. What am I supposed to do? Why, I, I don't, my, my footing is not where it needs to be because maybe I haven't been in the word enough. My footing isn't where I need to be because I haven't been praying enough. But here I am, I'm just kind of on, on, on shifting sand and they're telling me that I got to do all these things. I got to go here, I got to go there. You tell me I got to speed up, I got to slow down, I got to do all these things. When, when God is telling me to come to him, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give me rest, he will give you rest. So no matter what we're facing, we just need to slow down and get our footing. That's what I think of when I think here of of putting on the the shoe, or it says for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. Because there is no peace that this world can offer us that is anywhere close to being as good as the peace that God offers us. If you're looking for peace in in anywhere else, you're not going to find it. Not what God wants you to have. And in addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Faith from God and not fear. Pray first this morning with a heart of faith and and not a heart of fear. Put on on salvation as your helmet, protecting your mind and taking every thought captive. And take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus used scripture when he was tested. Why shouldn't we? While we're praying, we can pray scripture. We talked a while back about memorizing scripture. Or if you struggle to memorize, write it down. You can get these bracelets. Take, take, take four or five. Wear them around. And then verse 18 says this. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. <laughs> And be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Prayer is reloading, not retreating, not running scared. Have you, heard, have, you had, have you prayed prayers and made decisions and someone comes up to you and says, don't be ridiculous. Why are you doing that? Are you sure? Are you sure you should do that? That's what, that's what David was told. He's like, I'll go fight this guy. And the first thing he hears is, are you, 
Don't be ridiculous. The battle you're fa- that, that you're a part of is just too, too scary. It's too big. It's too impactful. And, and if you just pray first, you should have been acting first because you, you, you don't know what's going to happen. How are you so calm and filled with peace? Because we can start with prayer in every situation. But it's going to take some work. It's going to take some work. Are you up for it? Are you up for it? Are you willing to get to the point where no matter what happens, you pray first? It's, it's going to be a process. Pray, praying first reminds us that this battle is not against flesh and blood. It isn't against what we can see. It isn't against the enemy who is roaming around seeking people to devour. We won't be those people today any longer who are just running around scared. We will reload and protect our hearts and our minds. Why? Because the battle is the Lord's. The battle we are facing today is God's. Maybe you need to say that to yourself. Maybe this morning, I wonder what unnecessary battle wounds you have from fighting wars that weren't yours to fight with weapons that didn't work against someone or something that wasn't even the right enemy. Where in your life have you retreated instead of reloaded? What have you given up on or given into that God wanted you to persist in today? Saul said to, be, uh, said to this five foot nothing guy with no experience and no weapons worthy of the fight, or so they thought in verse 33, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. The King James in verse 34 just, just states this, and David, he didn't even pay any mind to what, what Saul said. He just ignored it. For some of you, you need to start ignoring what the enemy is trying to tell you. And the lies that he's, he's con- continuing just to repeat over and over and over. And it's filling you with fear. Where do you need to persist today? What do you need to pay no mind to today? What battles are you trying to fight with weapons that aren't from God? What struggles are you facing that God can't handle? When we reload in prayer, when we pray first, we remember who is with us and who is on our side. We've been given the name of Jesus to speak over our lives. Have you ever done that? You've been somewhere with something going on and you say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, be with me. Jesus, be with this person. When we call on the name of Jesus, we reload our spirits. We recharge our strength and we replenish our soul. There's just something about that name. The old song says that kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there is something about the name of Jesus. Worry can pass when we pray the name of Jesus. Do you believe that today? Doubt can dissolve when we pray the name of Jesus. Fears can be calmed when we pray the name of Jesus. Pray first. And then pray second. Wouldn't that have been funny if I came today and the, 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 the sermon today was pray second? Be like, what about praying first? I know somebody would have said something. <laughs> Next week's not pray third. But really, those should be the first three steps when we come across the battle. We should pray and then pray some more and then pray again. Praying scripture over our lives. We can reload this morning and we don't have to retreat from whatever we're facing. We can go today in the strength and power of Jesus. We too can say over whatever we're facing, today the Lord will conquer you. What are you facing? What are you struggling with? And can, will you pray that prayer today that God will conquer my issue? God will conquer my struggle. God will conquer my situation. As the band comes today, I'm going to have you stand and we're going to read another prayer together. This week it's from St. Patrick. It's a great prayer for us to pray each day. And so if you pray as they're coming, stand with me. We're going to read this together. And then we're going to sing, I speak the name of Jesus. Let's read this prayer today. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left. 
Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. And a great prayer. What a covering prayer that is.